Thank you for showing up for uh, HRT 312.0.1. Uh, uh, this is uh, Beer and Culture. Uh, you're at the Collins College of Hospitality Management. Uh, we are recording this for future endeavors uh, and such, but I need to introduce you to the guest speaker for today. Uh, she is a, a good friend. Uh, I don't say that lightly because friends are hard to come by in my world. Uh, but she's been working with me at uh, Ritual now for multiple years. Seven years? It's been forever. It's been a long time. And I, I'm so glad and I'm, I feel privileged to have her as an employee because there's not, you, it has, it's difficult to find somebody with as much passion and dedication and a, uh, an ability to be able to do their job and one that wants to learn more about their job. Uh, she is a beer uh, professional, a beer expert. Uh, and I, I don't say that lightly, I don't say nerd or anything else like that because she is really truly an expert. She's done fun things uh, such in her life. Uh, uh, there was another person we had as a guest speaker, got together with him and several other beer drinkers and consumed $30,000 worth of beer in one day. Okay, $30,000 worth of beer in one day. You get together with your friends, buy some expensive bottles of beer, and let's sit around and drink it. Okay, if that's not professionalism, I'm not sure what is. Uh, so I'm, uh, and she's got a, one heck of a palate. She is a certified Cicerone. Uh, so she's a full Cicerone that way, which is that uh, beer guide, uh, like a, a wine sommelier, but for beer. Uh, she's gonna be speaking today. Well, she also works at Innovation Brew Works as their social coordinator and program. The, the beer education program. She'll give you details on that one, beer program education coordinator. Um, so she'll give you details on that one. She's got a lot of great information today. She's going to be speaking to you about beer trends, uh, 2019, 2020, perhaps in the past where things are going. She also recently got back from Thailand just last week, week and a half. Yes, I don't have the... She doesn't have the virus, don't worry about it. She made it through quarantine, no problem. Uh, but she went over there and uh, was, was married recently to a, a long, long, uh, long life uh, a partner. I know, congratulations, Adam. How long did it take him to pop the question? Oh my God. Okay, there it is. Never mind. I'm just joking. Uh, but she's a great personality. She's going to keep you awake. She's going to talk to you about trends. I, uh, I encourage you to ask questions during this because she is a wealth of information. She's only going to be able to skim over the top of it, but I think you should be able to uh, glean some information and get some good, uh, good quality uh, learning here. Uh, any questions so far? Anything else we need to go over? We are going to be going over other things after she gets done talking, uh, so hang in there. And may I introduce, because I can't say her name correctly, so we call her affectionately, just JJ. So give a big round of applause for JJ. Hi, hi everybody. My name is JJ. It's Jirashia, but no, not a lot of people can say it. So pretty much I can't promise you I keep you awake. Like whatever Owen just promised you guys, but I'm sure I'll try to make it pretty interesting. So I'll be covering like a little bit about um, what people are drinking now, what um, different breweries are producing, and um, how the beer trends are going in the next this year, next year. Um, so I this pictures right here. It's um just we just have a lot of friends that are interested in the same thing. Just uh, go to different breweries and pick up different beers. Um, I don't know about $30,000 worth of beer. That sounds like we drank a lot, but. What do you want? Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Good. Yeah, I don't you want to click? You just click, yeah, you'll go. Now I have a beer in my hand. That's good. <laughs> Not yet, but we will. Not yet, okay. All right, so um, uh, what he introduced me as, um, certified this around, it's like level two, and I think you guys already met Gavin Harper, he's the highest, highest level, he's a master Cicerone, very knowledgeable guy. Um, so what I know about beers, and pretty much through working in the industry, I've been working in the beer industry for almost nine years now. Um, started at BevMo, so I was a, um, I was ordering beers at one of the branch at BevMo, that's how I got interested in to learn different kind of beers, and that was probably about 2010, and at that time, the beer industry started to uh, get more interesting. People paid attention a little bit more about craft beers. Um, before, uh, not a lot of people, people were still drinking just mass beer, uh, Budweiser, Bud Coors, 
years, um, 2010, that's when um, a lot more breweries start popping up and uh, gain more attention with the drinker craft with the beer drinkers. So people become more experimental, want to um, expand the palates with the different kind of beers. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about a little bit about different styles and also talk about beer cultures around the world and talk about um, what fun to do if you guys happen to be traveling around or different beer festival that um, happen in the US or around the world. Just, I'm only gonna mention a few because we don't have a whole lot of time, but um, so this one, this other styles of beers that have been pretty popular the past year or two, so everybody probably know what hazy IPA by now, but it became pretty popular probably maybe about eight years ago, it came around to the beer scenes and people were just wondering what this is because before everybody were drinking West Coast IPA, which is more, um, have more of the grapefruit, have more piney flavor to it, a little bit more bitter. Um, a lot of people didn't, it was hard for people to get into when people um, say, I don't drink IPA because it was more bitter. But then this style of beer came around it was a style of beer that had more of the burst of the, what people would start say a juiciness to it with this style of beer. So have more of a, well, citrusy flavor, have, um, it's a little bit hint of sweetness to it and it doesn't finish as bitter as West Coast IPA. So it became very popular among, um, even people that doesn't drink craft beer before, they started to drink um, hazy IPA and they would always tell other people they don't like West Coast IPA, or they, they don't like IPA because it's so bitter, and then they try to style beer, and people would just cause some craze over this because it's so easy to drink. Um, and I'll talk about where it comes from. And now everybody, every, every brewery in the country you go into, everybody makes hazy IPA. It's also um, become one of the style, style for Great American Beer Festival, well, a brewer association also um, acknowledge that this is a style of beer that people can enter a uh, competition to win it. Um, and then second beer, second style of beer will be barrel aged beer. So I will go over why is this um, something that people like to drink. Well, I would say it, it's, um, with this style of beer, usually a little bit stronger beer, it's like Imperial Stout or Barley Wine, um, and it's aged in the barrel to add more complexity to it. Um, a lot of breweries have barrels program. It creates exclusiveness and it just makes people want it more because the quantity that each brewery produces is very little. So we'll go talk more about this barrel aged beer. Um, sour beer, um, a lot of people been drinking sour beer before. Sour beer was something that was easier to find. So 10, 15 years ago, not a lot of American breweries make sour beer. But now you walk into, same thing, just hazy, with like hazy IPA, you walk in all the breweries, you guarantee to find one or two sour beers um, on their menu. But um, I think you guys already talked about the Belgian sour beer. So American sour beer, that's difference to it. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, American sour beer and um, what's like makes people really liking it and why is it become such a big deal right now too. And the last one is called pastry stout. It's not a style of beer but it just um, kind of describes like the flavor profile of particular. Um, so stout that added a lot of sugar flavor to it. So that I'm gonna show you a few examples of why I call it pastry stout. It tastes like cake, it tastes like dessert. That's why people really liking it. Very, very sweet stout. So it's not a style, but it's um, just became very popular the past four or five years and it's not going away because um, also the people have their palates for sweet stuff. People really like the mid stuff. Um, talk about the hazy IPA. So starting in Vermont, um, these two guys, one is, the co one is the owner of the brew pub in Vermont and he um, employed this person named John to work with him and he created this style and people were not understanding that before, and that was in early in the mid 1990s. So, if 
during that time, people just know about Sierra Nevada um, IPA or um, whatever, like Angostine, whatever map, bigger breweries uh, produce IPA. People didn't understand when this haze, hazier beer, not clear beer came out, people were not happy about it, then they calling that IPA. So, um, and the hop, hop that they use in it does create that more citrusy notes to it, easier to drink, less bitterness. Um, and that's just, uh, just created there at the Vermont Brew Pub. And when, um, the, so the, co -owner, the owner of the Vermont Pub gave the recipe to John who uh, go ahead, he went ahead and started his own brewery called Alchemist. And Alchemist make a very popular IPA called Heavy Topper and also Focal Banger. Um, it, and you can see the appearance of the beer is not a clear beer. And until probably mid 2000, like about 2015, 2016, everybody have to go out to the location to get the beers. They don't do dis uh, alchemist. They don't do distribution. They can. They um, well, I would say they won't distribute. They don't distribute outside of Vermont. So anything that's like 20 miles, 25 mile radius from the brewery. So people would go. To Vermont, people that really want to get a taste of um, the beer that's called Haiti Topper, the can, they would go wait in line and they would go, um, well, they don't sell the brewery, sorry, so they would go wait until the truck that uh, that carry the Haiti Topper beer go out to the account. People would drive and follow the truck to the account to buy the beer. So it was just something that's created this also. Um, supply demand things too, something that's trendy, people want it, they don't create it a lot and you can't get anywhere. You can't just walk into State of Brothers and just get four pack. So, and um, people want it, then people, then it's pretty much just distributed by the consumer because they don't have their own distribution. The consumer go to um, whatever store they're selling right around outside of the breweries and um, they will tell their friend outside of Vermont, tell their friends in New York, tell their friends in California, Washington, like, hey, got this can, you want some, I can ship you some. And people will pay some crazy money for a can or two of it. People just pay $10, $15 for a can of just a beer that just come out from Vermont. And then people, more and more people get the taste of it. People really want more of it. So that just become, Vermont become the, the capital of KZI PA pretty much. And then there's a couple more other breweries in that area that started to make um, more this style of beer. Um, there's Treehouse Brewing in Massachusetts. That's another brewery that don't have distribution. They've been around since about 2011. Small, small brewery like the side of this room. They never have distribution. They don't sell their cakes. They just can their beers. And people go line up and just buy the beer. And the brewery would get the limit just keep the limit for about eight cases per person. Everybody would just go with a hand truck and just take it home and just give to the friends, sell it to people. Because you're not supposed to, it's illegal to sell beer if you don't have license to sell beer. So, um, they, and now the brewery is pretty much, I don't know if you guys been ritual brewing before, but the brewery I just mentioned, Tree House Brewing in Massachusetts is probably about five, probably almost like seven times bigger than Ritual Brewing now from something that started from this size of the room. Don't have distribution. Um, people, the consumer just wants it. They go get the beer at the brewery and just self-distribute among themselves. Uh, people just like the taste. It's just pretty much exclusiveness that people also really um, want to get to hand on with some of these style of beers too. Um, so like they mentioned, hey, Haiti Topper is a double IPA. It's the first highly sought after in New England IPA. So it's just, it, at that time, you just have to know somebody that lived in Vermont to be able to get the hand of it. And also there's another brewery in Vermont that uh, started in early 2000 that also um, keep the tradition of Hazy IPA and they make it really well. Um, out one hour outside of Burlington, which is like one of the bigger city in Vermont. And you have to drive far, it's off on the dirt road. Um, called Hill Farmstead, and then they also make really good hazy IPA. They don't distribute either. So these people in Vermont, they really want to make this like very exclusive for people. You have to go out there, get the can, um, share with friends, and try to sell it for $15 a can. Um, this
is this a picture of this is a picture of the alchemist the brewery uh, they moved from the old location that was really close to Burlington and this right outside of Burlington the city called Stowe and um, I got a chance to visit it three years ago um, it's very unique because they don't have a tasting room it's just production facility and they just have um, the little area that they just give you the taste of the beers that they have on tap so if you want to taste the hippie topper they will put two ounces in the glass but you can get as many as you want which is really weird like you can pretty much drink for free but the, the, the regulation in Vermont is very strict too with um, if you don't have a kitchen they can only serve um, maybe like two pints of beers um, so it's just a production facility for them but they were able to give people sample and people just buy cans and take home uh, they sometimes have special events on premise so this one they got the permit to be able to have music and um, pouring uh, selling beer outside of the lawn so if you visit this part of the country if you go to some the breweries in Vermont or um, some, some somebody else has like beer law like Massachusetts don't like name that that side of the country check the hours of operation and check um, if they have special event because if you go all the way out there sometimes it's not even gonna guarantee you're gonna be able to get a pint or two of beer it's just gonna be there to taste the beer and just buying beers to take home so yeah, so we just were lucky that day they had an event outside. They were selling cans outside and you were actually able to buy cans and enjoy the beer there. But otherwise, we just have to buy cases of beer and take home with us. Um, that's the, whole, the production facility that they have. It's very, very state of the art. Um, this brewery has been open for about four or five years now. They moved to this facility. So also, the, they still don't distribute outside of Vermont either the cans of the stuff from Alchemist. And here's a few other brands that make Casey IPA, um, one of the well-known producer of Casey IPA. So the purple and green cans, those are the brewery I mentioned that from Massachusetts called Greenhouse, I'm sorry, Treehouse Brewing Company. The one that don't distribute anywhere, people go also just consumer go distribute the that beers different places and there's the one there's one with the alien printed on the can that's one is from monkish brewing and this brewery is in Torrance so it's about 45 minutes from here with no traffic with traffic like it's like an hour and a half so yeah um, they also don't distribute the cans in the store, so people go line up to pick up the beer. So the line culture is really starting from um, with it's exclusive, it's, uh, brewery creating exclusiveness for the, this, uh, this kind of beer. They will, um, it's just them marketing too. They will put on social media, we only produce 150 cases. We're gonna start selling at say 2 p.m. on a Thursday, so I mean, people trying to find their way to go out there. Uh, if it's just weekend, a lot of these breweries will say, we're gonna sell the beer at noon. So usually they only announce it about an hour before two. So people just find their way to go out there, line up and buy all the beer. Um, Monkish Brewing been around for eight years. Um, that brewery didn't make IPA before for the first four years. They only make Belgian style beer but then they figured that's not something that actually bringing them money. So they started to um, learn how to make this beer. They traveled to the East Coast and learned it from people that from Vermont, New York, um, brewery that been making this style for a while and then they brought it back. They were one of the brewery in California that made Easy Style IPA that um, have the, the profile very similar to the East Coast producer. So people will go nuts for it. When they first release the cans, um, people were lining up five, six hours before they started set to sell the can. And these cans are not cheap either. Four packs of $16 or four packs of $21. So, and they were able to sell out almost every release now. If you follow them on Instagram, you will see um, it's just how they're marketing things, even though they're releasing beer every week. And um, they will guarantee almost sell out like in the first day or the second day, it depends on the style of what beer that they release. Uh, also, this one is Citra from Hill Farmstead. That's the one I 
we're talking about is if you have to go outside of Burlington. It's a beautiful property. They also make wild ale and saison. Um, they have world-class brewery. Um, but when you get there, you can only have two beer, and you drove about an hour outside of Burlington. And uh, you have to like have they have like 50 selections on the menu. You just really have to pick and choose what you want. And they have very limit, limited selection of bottles and cans to go. So the rest you just have to take it to go. So yeah, so it's, it's, that's that's why it's great. Um, like desirability for the people. It is. So these are notable. Northeast IPA, so hazy IPA, New, oh, sorry, New England IPA. So these are the term that what they call like this style of beer, New England IPA, hazy IPA. Uh, a lot of time also, and it makes it more desirable to easier to drink, and it, it's a little bit fruitier than West Coast IPA. Guava, mango, orange, I put mango again because I really like mango. <laughs> so that's what the um, aroma and the flavor that you get out of this. Um, the mouthfeel is a little bit, um, a little bit heavier. It's not as crisp because it's less carbonation. So it's like drinking juice, like consistency with a little bit of carbonation to it. That's why people really like it. It's very easy to drink. Um, oh, the next one we're gonna talk about is sour beer. So I have a few examples of this bottle right here. A couple of the breweries here um, are local. The Sour Cellars in Rancho Cucamonga, they only make sour beers, and they're very small producers. It's husband and wife operation. They've been around for four years. And the, on, the, on your right side, right, last two bottles, these are from Omar's Brewing Company. It's in downtown Pomona. So yeah, one of their specialty, they make sour beer. So um, just a few different Reminders of different styles of sour beer. There's Lambic, traditional um, Belgian style, Lambic, Goo, Flanderes, and Ubrun. Those are traditional Belgian style sour beer. And then Belinda Weisse, which is, Gavin told me to say that, Belinda Weisse. So that one is the German style, and goes as a German, German style beer. So um, we're going to talk about how American breweries start making more sour style beers. and. It's not exactly the same of what the Belgian producers are making, but it's um, kind of give the consumer more of the uh, flavor for something that just they used to before when people think about drinking beer that uh, the <coughs> consumer, consumer knows about. You say think drinking beer, I think about like Pilsner, something that like mass, mass beer, Budweiser, or like IPA, Pale Ale, Sierra Nevada, people know that, Angry Scheme. So when a lot more American producers start making sour beers to give the consumer more of the variety, variety of the options and give the people that say they don't like beer when they try sour beer, they just more, they always like, first time try sour beer, like what is this, is this beer? Because it doesn't taste like the beer that people know before. Um, also a lot of time sour beer will be added fruit to it. Uh, the style, like the very popular, very popular style in a lot of American uh, sour making. I mean, American brewers that make out that make right now a Berliner Weiss and um, goes a goes a summer beer too. They call it, consider for seasonal beer is will be um, will be summer style beer, very low in alcohol percent, and a lot of time it will be fruited. So be added raspberry, strawberry, peach, whatever you can think of. Um, it's just really refreshing, easy to drink. Um, it's very popular. So when I just mentioned to one of the first brewery in the U.S. that started, started to can the Gosa style is the is Westbrook, and Westbrook is in it's in the Midwest, and people would really like it because it's really lightly salted. Because just traditional style, the Gosa style um, has a little hint of salt in it. So it's very lightly salted and it has, uh, I think it's like lamb zest in it, lemon zest in it. So it's like really refreshing, about 4% ABV. Very, very easy to drink. And that that can, you can find in the store. It's not something that's hard to get. So Westbrook um, have more distribution in California now. So you can get the, that beer easily. Sometimes they <coughs> get one with the, 
they did one with grapefruit before too, and Westbrook also make barrel aged beer, bourbon barrel aged style beer. So if you go to a lot of craft, specialty craft beer store, you can find Westbrook on the shelf if you want to try this style of beer. It's definitely um, really easy to get. And I'm comparing to another brewery, this beer over here, this is a brewery from Florida called uh, Jay Wakefield, and they're in Miami. So this one is really, it's harder to get because they do a smaller smaller release, smaller production. They add a lot of fruit to it. Look at the color of that. It's, it's very, very pink, magenta. So DFPL is the name of the beer. So they add dragon fruit and passion fruit into it to get like a lot of fruited flavor into that beer. And this is a smaller release too. So people have to be, have to go over there when they release it to be able to get some of this beer, um, but if you happen to be in Miami area, the brewery is really fun. They have different style of beer. They're known for making different style of um, fruited Belinda White style. And I was gonna mention that a lot of the sour beers that make in the U.S. the U.S. the U.S. brewers um, mostly get that put out um, in the tasting room. Usually are kettle sour, so kettles kettle souring method that you use to make a sour beer. So it's not traditional that you um, make the beer, let the beer have the surface contact with the wild yeast, and the yeast can take a while, a while to develop the flavor profile, and then which which means after they put in the barrel, so like the wine barrels, um, that's a traditional method for Lambic. Um, it takes a few years to beer, for beer to develop the character and souring, but when kettle souring method is pretty much like over like over like a few days, like the beer started to be sour because um, the bacteria like the bacillus get introduced to it, and also Bertinomyces yeast get introduced to it to add more complexity to it. And so, like I mentioned, that kettle souring, quick souring production, if the salad goes down blown away. So a lot of when you walk up in a lot of brewery tasting room and they say they have sour on sour beer on there. Most of the beers are the, have done by this style, by kettle souring. Um, the brewery I mentioned earlier, which is um, the one in Rancho Lamanca, Sour Cellar, they actually try to do more of the method of the traditional way that the Belgian is doing it. Um, they will do um, wild, introduce the wild yeast to the beer. They age the beer in a barrel for at least two, three years. So before they even open their door, they were started to make beer and age their beer for two years before they started to bottle and open the business. So it took a while. If you think that you wanna be, you wanna open a brewery that just makes sour beer, it takes a while to open your door because you have to have the beer, it took a few years to have the beer ready to sell it. So you go, if you go on to different liquor stores that have a lot of craft beer selection or a few of Total Wine, that, a few selection at Total Wine as well, you'll see the price point for sour beers are a lot higher than regular beer because it just takes a longer time to make and it's um the, the quantity that they produce they can't produce a whole lot either. So and that's why sour beer is quite popular as well. Thank you. Your backwards. I'm going backwards. So we were talking about people that also doing, these are breweries that have been doing sour beers for the longer than, we should mean longer, they've been doing it for like 15 years or like 20 years. So, so Russian Brewing Company in Santa Rosa is probably one of the first brewery in the um, US that introduced a sour method, sour beer. They age the beer in different wine barrels, of different varieties, Chardonnay, Carbonate barrel, um, and then Cascade Brewing that's in Portland, Oregon. They also, one of the first breweries that makes sour beer. Um, the Rare Barrels in Berkeley, uh, supposed to be the brewery, B-R-U-E-L-Y, but autocorrect. So this one in Placentia. So if you, which is like 20 minutes from here, if you guys haven't been there before, they have a facility that just serve the barrel beers, um, barrel sour, barrel aged stout, barrel barley wine, called Teru. 
which is around the corner from the original location of the brewery. Um, so that is also a good place to explore um, different styles of barrel-aged beer because they have so many offerings. You go in there sometimes it's quite overwhelming. They have about 40 different options for you. Um, the, brewer, the brewery usually just encourage people to do flight. So they will have you do six flights of something that's 13% beer. So I mean, take your own journey, guys. <laughs> and that's another brewery is Jester King Brewery. And that one in Austin, Texas. And Jester King is only one of the US brewery that get that accepted by uh, this. So in Belgium, if you make, if you produce sour beer, you have you belong to this organization. It's called Forest, and there's only five, four or five Belgian breweries that have been traditionally making sour beer for the longest time that belong to that organization. Um, Jester King is one of the brewery in the U.S. that accepted to that pro, that organization that make a, the method of the, the sour making is very similar to the way that the Belgian producer make. So. Um, it's just an hour right outside Austin. Beautiful facility, have acres and acres. They have goats on the property you can play with. Yeah, so I would hire, and then just drinking beers, you can find some on the shelf. They, they have Saison on the shelf out here, but some of the, the fruited stuff, are the, the one that they add fruit to it, fruit is sour, are the one that you have to go to the brewery to get that. But you can find a Saison on the shelf out here in some of the uh, craft beers liquor store out here. And we'll talk about the pastry style, which is not an official style of beer, but it's just really, really sweet, deep, rich flavor of the stout. And this particular one that I have in the photo here is from Omni Polo, and it's a brewery from Sweden. It's in Stockholm. It's, yeah, that's a brewery, like a tasting room in Stockholm. So this beer, they put maple syrup in it and blueberry. So it's a really heavy, syrupy stout that pretty much have a lot of sweetness from maple syrup and also a lot of fruitiness from the blueberry. And that's what they're trying to do with, with the flavor of this to taste like pancake soaked in syrup, blueberry pancake soaked in syrup. This style of beer, usually a little bit higher percent alcohol too because zero age, well, yeah, this one is zero age beer. But usually they pick something that between 10 to like 15% to add it, all of this um, additive to it, the flavoring to it to make it more like dessert-like and the textures. And talk, the modern day barrel aged beer, I think everybody might have heard of the brewery called Goose Island. They're from Chicago. Um, they are not independent brewery anymore for the past 10 years also part of AB Inba, but they are responsible for creating the bourbon barrel aged beer style. So you're gonna see this beer on the shelf at a lot of store now. Um, the, the packaging is different now. This is from 2012, but they release this beer every Black Friday. So about six, seven years ago when uh, they decided to do more marketing for this beer. They've been around, this beer has been around for almost like 15 years. But when they decided to market it more, they released it on Black Friday. People will go wait in line at Bevmo or Total Wines or liquor store that guarantee will get this beer. People will wait for the store to open, like regular Black Friday shopping. So they have, it's great marketing for them, make it like a traditional release every Black Friday. People go wait to buy that. And it's, a, it's an Imperial Stout aged in a bourbon barrel. So it's got a lot of um, chocolate notes to it. Just the malt profile in it already chocolate, have a lot of like chocolate flavor. And when you age in the bourbon barrel, it gets more of the, a little bit of the barrel from the bourbon flavor, just a little bit, not boozy. So this one is pretty much, I would say a good introduction to a <coughs> barrel aged beer that's done really well. It's easier to drink than a lot of uh, bourbon barrel aged stout. Uh, a lot of bourbon barrel aged stout, if it's not done right, it's just gonna be really boozy or taking too much of the bourbon character out of it. And uh, so with the process of uh, 
before finish the product for the bourbon barrel aged beer too, the production team will go in and sample the barrels. So they will pull different samples from the barrel to taste each beer, and then that's a method of blending. So they will blend all the beers that they tasted together and see which one, which barrel blended best with which which barrel, and um, decide on that will be the final product. So that's more of um, just trying it out and see what what works best. Um, and most common style of the barrel aged beer are stout, barley wine, sour beer. That's some lager too. So, but the most common one that you see in the market as far as barrel aged beer will be stout. Stout barley wine and sour beer. Mm. And sour beers, I mentioned before, are mostly aged in the wine barrels. Red wine barrel, white wine barrel, um, depends what the makers want it to be. And these are more, these are very popular barrel aged beer, bourbon barrel aged beer in particular. So the one on the, that end with the wax on top is from Three Foy Brewery. And Three Foy is from Indiana. So that label was just really cool artwork and that beer just really, really rich, rich flavor. They um, released the non-barrel version and they released the barrel version. They do this uh, event every year called Dark Lord Day. So every year people will, it's just like a mini beer festival where you drink a lot of strong beer like this. And you go, it's a mess. And usually it's that time of year in Chicago that it rains a lot too. So you see a bunch of drunk guys and gals just, you know, take a nap everywhere. Um, so this is a cool thing to check it out, like as far as understand um, the trend culture. Um, this, they're one of the first brewery that um, do the bottle release and also with the kind of beer festival kind of thing. Um, and that's one. They also make a lot of different out of style beer as well, but that's what they're very known for. Um, as far as like a stronger beer is the Dark Lord. And different label, different year. And they never label to what vintage on the bottle. They just wax the top with different color. And if you want to find out what vintage it is, just to color code it. You have to go online, color code on their website what vintage it is. Um, the particular, well, I picked up heavily notes of soy sauce in that beer. Uh, some of, because stout, uh, with the type of malt that used in stout, will create like a lot of umami flavor, like soy sauce have umami. Um, but that, that, that particular beer just smell like soy sauce. And a lot of people in the community, if you like even go Google online about, talk about flavor profile of Dark Lord, you'll see like a lot of people talk about, taste just like soy sauce, soy sauce. Like that's what people associate Dark Lord with, with the flavor of soy sauce. I mean, it would be desirable for a lot of people, but um, it's, it's just how people like things too, you know? I think it's fine. It does definitely have like that on the nose. And with one thing with tasting beer, you already have people saying that in your ear immediately you're already gonna think it without just drinking it yet. But I guess that's also one thing that people go online already reading about this beer before they even try it, and then they have like the sick of it, it's like, oh yeah, it's just like what everybody say, it tastes like soy sauce. And the second one here is from a brewery in uh, Decora, I think it's in Iowa, in Iowa. And a brewery called Toppling Goliath. Uh, this one is Kentucky, KBBS, Kentucky Bourbon Breakfast Stout. So this bottle about this much, this small, the quantity, um, is a bourbon barrage in Curl Stout. And it's one of the ones that get a lot of hype around it too. Um, I mentioned before, not supposed to sell beer, secondary, after, like you're not supposed to, but there's people that are doing that for sure. And I've seen people talking about um, secondary value goes up to a couple thousand dollars for something this big. Yeah, so two thousand dollars for something this big, and you have to go, you know, but nowhere, Iowa to pick up a bottle. And what they've been doing now, um, before they came, they they got more popularity, so they started raffling raffle system about four years ago. You have to ruff, raffle online. You get email that you can buy. You have to go yourself to middle of nowhere, Iowa, pick up the bottle yourself. It's not a destination, guys.